cancer is a multifocal process. It isn't, it doesn't attack just on one level. It's a multi-level disease. And so you have to come at it from every every angle, basically. Hi, everyone. Drew Prode here, host of the Broken Brain Podcast. Today's episode, we're talking with one of the most respected leaders in the field of integrative cancer care. His name is Dr. Ralph Moss. I believe in him so much that a few years ago, many years ago, almost eight, my mom was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer, and I put Dr. Moss as one of the individuals on her integrative cancer team to help her achieve her best health and beat cancer and keep her immune system strong. I want to report that she's doing fantastic today, and a lot of that is because of Dr. Moss's guidance. We're going to be talking with Dr. Moss about the current state of the union of cancer care that's out there and how there might be some parts that are good, but there's some other parts that are the bad and the ugly, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. We're going to have an honest conversation about those so that you can be more empowered if you ever knock on wood, I hope it doesn't happen to anybody who's listening, but we know by the stats that most likely it will. If you're ever touched by cancer, if your family members are touched by cancer, this is the guy and this is the episode that you want to listen to. You know, especially in this day and age of coronavirus and COVID-19, if you look at a lot of the people that are um, um, ultimately end up passing away from the coronavirus, they already have a current chronic disease. And one of the ones that's top out there right now is that individuals who are already have a weakened immune system because of battling cancer. So this podcast was recorded a few months ago. Uh, so we won't be addressing coronavirus specifically, but we will be talking about the immune system. And we will be talking about three things, three things that are up and coming emerging areas in the space of integrative cancer care that Dr. Moss finds very promising. So number one, make sure you get his free ebook. It's in the show notes below. And number two, uh, pull out a notepad because you're going to enjoy today's episode. Here we go with Dr. Ralph Moss. Welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast, where we dive deep in the topics of neuroplasticity, epigenetics, mindfulness, functional medicine, and mindset. I'm your host, Drew Prode, and each week, my team and I bring on a new guest who we think can help you improve your brain health, feel better, and live more. This week's guest is Dr. Ralph Moss. Dr. Ralph Moss received his PhD from Stanford University and was the former science writer and assistant director of public affairs at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York. Since leaving Sloan Kettering in 1977, Dr. Moss has independently evaluated the claims of conventional and non-conventional cancer treatments all over the world. For the past 25 years, Dr. Moss has been producing Moss Reports, which can be found at mossreports.com. And the Moss Reports are a unique set of documents that give readers an unbiased and in-depth look at conventional and alternative treatment options for the most common cancer types. His latest book, Cancer Incorporated, is a blistering critique of the cancer drug business and shows how big pharma's deceptions have caused suffering and cost lives. Dr. Moss, welcome to the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you, Drew. Pleasure to be here. And I want to thank you for taking such good care of all the different people that I've sent over your way because you also do phone consultations. And one of the people that you've done uh, numerous phone consultations has been my mother, Darshna Perowit. Shout out to my mother who got diagnosed with breast cancer uh, a few years ago. And one of the first people when we were setting up my mom's team uh, that was guiding her on what treatments would work best for her and what alternative treatments we could bring in for her breast cancer was yourself. So I want to thank you for helping me take care of my mom, who's doing fantastic and is in remission. And uh, a large part of that was due to your guidance. So we appreciate you. Thank you. I want to start off in the beginning. Take us back to 1977 and give listeners a little bit of an idea of your backstory when it comes to the world of cancer. Well, I was hired at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York in 1974 as the science writer, later promoted to assistant director of public affairs. And uh, almost from the very start, we were involved with the evaluation of a of a substance called laetrile or amygdalin. It's a derivative of apricot kernels. And a lot of people at that time were saying that they 
felt that they had gotten benefit uh, from it in terms of treatment, and the medical establishment reacted very negatively towards it. Um, we at Sloan Kettering uh, had a statement that I gave out saying basically that it was worthless and people shouldn't turn to that instead of to you know reputable science. When I went up that summer to interview Kanamatsu Sugiyora, who was the uh, oldest and most uh, senior researcher at Sloan Kettering. And in the course of the interview, I asked him, of course, what he was working on. And he said, I'm working on amygdalin. And it took me a minute to realize that amygdalin was this notorious laetrile that we were basically uh, throwing shade on uh, for, out of our public affairs office. So it kind of astonished me, and I then probed further, and I basically said, well, why would you work on this if it's if it's worthless? And he took down from the shelf his own notebooks um, showing the shrinkages of tumors when he administered high doses of this, uh, we'll call it a drug. But uh, when I, uh, I expressed surprise at this, he said, well, that's really nothing. This is the important thing that in, in uh, cases where uh, the cancer s- spreads from the, the breast tissue to the lungs in, in experimental mice, 80 or 90% of them will get lung metastases or secondary growths in the lung. But when he administered the laetrile, only 10 to 20% of them develop metastases. This is a fantastic uh, finding because there were then and probably still are no drugs that could be administered that would stop metastases in such a dramatic way. And uh, he felt that it was non-toxic. In fact, he said that the mice that got the laetrile were healthier looking, their coats were shiny, they were livelier and so forth. So I I came away from that interview very confused and uh, basically was assigned by my boss, Jerry Delaney, to monitor what Dr. Segura was doing and give him sort of an inside look at what was happening uh, in the in the institution. And over the next three years, that's exactly what I did. I actually had a great fondness for Dr. Segura uh, as an older mentor in my life. And he provided me with the uh, raw data of his experiments, uh, actually on my birthday in 1975, we had we had lunch and he, he gave that uh, to me. And it, over the course of those years, though, my the top officials, his bosses and my bosses, made increasingly negative statements about Laetrile, finally coming out with a statement saying that we had found Laetrile negative in all the animal systems we had tested. Now, at that point, we had tested it in three animal systems, it actually was positive in all three of those systems. And so this culminated in in November of 1977, where we had a, we, we basically, uh, in 77, we had a press conference and we declared to the world that Laetra was without value. Ironically, I was the person who wrote the press release for that press conference. But I also by that time was working with an underground group called Second Opinion, which was simultaneously exposing uh, these misdeeds and these lies basically on the part of the the top leadership. And then in in November of 77, I I, I, I came forward publicly to denounce this at a press conference and was fired on the next day for failing to carry out my most basic job responsibilities was how they put it. So Since that time, I've been involved in uh, a project, if you will, a self-directed project to understand why things like this happen, to document what actually happened, which I did in my book, Doctored Results, very thoroughly about five years ago, through a film called Second Opinion. And um, really, my whole career has started from that point on, or at least uh, my career as, as a critic of conventional oncology started in that time and it's gone on steadily since then. And now I've produced um, uh, a dozen books on various topics relating to cancer. And my latest is Cancer Incorporated, uh, which goes into much greater depth and detail than any of my other work, I would say. So I want to jump in and go back to that moment where you were fired for 
uh, basically coming back out and saying that this press release saying that the effects of this study that was done were negative when in fact there were some promising effects. And people would listen to that and say, wow, is this a cover up? Is this a suppression? And what's the motivation behind the higher ups who are choosing to go down that path of saying that something is negative when actually there was some positive research behind it? Well, I think the motivation differed from person to person. It basically was uh, fear and conformism and pressure put on them. I knew, of course, all of the the leaders of Sloan Kettering. My job as science writer brought me into contact with basically anybody I wanted to to interview and talk to. It was a great job, by the way. Um, but uh, some of them were convinced believers in in the uh, in the promise, let's say, of Laetrile and wanted to go full steam ahead with the research in an honest way. That would have been the people, Lloyd Old, who was one of the vice presidents of Sloan. Um, Robert Good, who was the president of uh, Sloan Kettering, was very adventurous in his mind, but um, basically afraid for his job because he had overspent on the immunology program and was being undercut by American Cancer Society. And Lewis Thomas, who was the president of the entire center, told my boss, now this is second or third hand, but I'll just repeat what he, what my boss told me, I'm not going to die on the barricades for Laetrile. It's only a palliative drug, meaning it only stops metastases. If it was a cure for cancer, I'd go to bat for it. But because it's only a palliative drug, I, I'm not going to ruin my wonderful career over it. So I think the motivations differed from our point of view, from this Memorial Sloan Kettering point of view, though, I think fear was the main thing. They were afraid of the damage that was going to be done to their beloved institution by advocating for something that was just hated by the establishment as a whole. In fact, you wrote in 1980, you say the suppression of unorthodox methods and the promotion of orthodox approach, the orthodox approach, takes place mainly at an objective unconscious level. It's sort of like you're saying that even though this is happening, it's not a grand conspiracy that's out there with a uh, few people that are pulling the strings. It's just a favoritism towards what feels like is established and backed by the big companies and a non favoritism towards what feels unorthodox in the approach to cancer. Yes, I think that's correct. I've never found, and I followed this issue very uh, closely, uh, I've never seen proof of a, of a, a conscious center uh, from which the suppression of uh, complementary or alternative medicine emanates. So uh, if you're making a, a grand conspiracy theory, you have to somehow come up with some uh, plausible explanation for where that's taking place. Plus, there's a common sense objection, which is that the uh, people who are involved in this suppression are themselves prone to get cancer. Of the four leaders of the can of my uh, former institution, Sloan Kettering, three of them died of cancer uh, subsequently. So uh, obviously, there's no known cure for cancer that's being suppressed. I think we can say that with certainty. But there is pre there is extreme prejudice against alternative treatments, and I think it's become clearer in the past uh, over the past forty years since I wrote those words that there is no c classical conspiracy. But on the other hand, every every prejudiced action favors the interests of big pharma. So the ultimate goal, regardless of how how people saw this subjectively at the time, the ultimate goal was to create a thriving industry where there were many patented drugs that basically could you could charge whatever you wanted for, and it created a hundred and twenty billion dollar industry. A can the cancer drug industry is about a hundred and twenty billion dollars. So uh, whether they intended this, how conscious they were of this we're not privy to those, you know, internal documents. I have seen some documents that would indicate that the smartest people, the most farsighted people did understand that they were sitting on a potential gold mine 
in the sense that people will do anything to get their hands on an effective cancer treatment. And all you have to do is promote it in such a way that people believe that it's effective. And then you, you're, all, you're all the way, you know, ready to run to the bank with the, with the proceeds. But it, I don't think it was a conspiracy. Uh, I don't think it's been proven that it was a, some grand conspiracy. On the other hand, as I say in, in my new book, Um, When we see the behavior of pharmaceutical executives around, for instance, the opioid catastrophe, there are conspiracies. They do exist. And I think everybody recognizes that now. And these people are being finally being held to account. So would I be shocked if it turned out that one or another company was actually plotting against the alternatives, which do to a certain degree threaten their profitability? No, I wouldn't be so shocked. But the, the burden of proof is on the people making the claim and they don't have the goods. They don't have the proof that such a thing exists. And I, I don't think we should, you know, sh- shout fire in a crowded theater, as it were, unless and until we have some something substantive to be able to prove that such a thing is going on. But the suppression okay. takes place at, a, at, a, at an objective level because the purpose of these companies is to maximize their profits and to to grow and alternative medicine gets in their way because it's not very profitable. It's somewhat profitable, but it's not, it's not super profitable the way that patented pharmaceuticals are super profitable. In fact, yes. And we're going to talk about that, you know, talk about how certain chemotherapies and interventions can cost up to a million dollars a year or a million dollars to implement for a patient, which brings up the whole question of even for some of these drugs, before we get into the question of their effectiveness, which is where we're going to go next, is that even are they accessible for the vast majority of people out there? You know, one of the reasons of the many that I really appreciate your book, Cancer Incorporated, which just to give a quick plug for, and we'll talk about at the end, you're making it available for free as an ebook. If people want to download it on the web, they can go to Moss Reports and they can find the link in the show notes and anybody can get access to this information. Uh, if you want a printed version, then you pay, I think it's like 20 bucks that's out there. So for anybody that wants that, you can go to the Moss Reports and get it. But for Cancer Incorporated, one of the beautiful things that's there and why it's so important that we want to do a podcast on this is that it doesn't do us any good to blame everything and the dysfunction on a vast conspiracy besides the fact that we don't actually have any proof and it's it's there's no proof that's out there it doesn't do any good to believe in that because you skip over all the nuances and the details that show you just how dysfunctional the the big pharma can be especially when it comes to cancer so before we dive into that topic i want to read a quote uh, or a stat that you shared in your book which is Let's talk about the current state of of like the current state of the union for cancer. So you said the overall death rate from cancer adjusted for the aging of the population fell by just 5% between 1950 and 2013. So my question for you is this every day on the news, on Google News, in the media, sometimes on social media, it seems that we're seeing some breakthrough drug, some breakthrough intervention out there that is that researchers or hospitals or the community or nonprofits and every walk that's out there is hanging their hopes on. How could it be that we've only seen a 5% improvement since 1950? Well, the vast majority of the advances that are touted over uh, the internet. I mean, there's just a steady stream of press releases and news stories and so forth. The vast majority of them either are taking place in the laboratory or, or else they, they measure the success of the treatment by bogus uh, yardsticks. So uh, you can dismiss the laboratory research, that's to say cell line research and animal research and so forth, not dismiss it in terms of its potential value, but dismiss it in terms of its relevance to what will happen to the average cancer patient when they go in for treatment, because the vast majority of those things for a variety of reasons never pan out. 
And I found this uh, the first day on the job at Sloan Kettering. What are you going to write about? I mean, there were, it wasn't in 1974, there was hardly even any chemotherapy. What I wrote about were interesting developments in the lab with mice and with, with cell lines, which were interesting. I mean, from a, from a reader, writer's and reader's point of view, there was fascinating things happening, some of which eventually did lead to treatments, but the vast majority of which are peripheral to the thing that's on the mind of the average person who goes online to look up cancer treatments. You know what they're looking for. They're looking for a treatment for themselves or for, for a loved one. And most of these stories that you read are just feel-good stories that are clickbait. Uh, they are they are trying to imply more than is really there. And then the second big mistake is that even when you're dealing with clinical uh, trials, the results of clinical trials, you have to be very careful because they use the word survival in unorthodox ways, at least from the point of view of the average person, the, the lay person, and even for many doctors, you'll see this drug increase survival by eight months. Now you drill down into that story, either the story itself or you go to the actual scientific paper. And more times than not, what they're talking about is progression-free survival or some similar term. This is not what you think. This is not increasing your lifespan or the lifespan of the patient. It means an art, it's an artificial construct. It means the time that elapses from the time you begin treatment to the time that they record the progression of the disease. Now, you may still die at exactly the same point you would have if you hadn't taken that drug, but it's still recorded in the, in the, in the uh, summary of the uh, clinical trial as some big advance. Oh, they got six months or a year of progression-free survival, but the group that didn't get the drug, the people died at the same, pr pretty much the same point that the people who did get the drug. So it's a bogus uh, measure. It's a way of, of tricking people really into thinking that uh, they'll live longer if they take the drug. But in most cases, that's not so. Um, they, there's the only thing that really matters in cancer are cure when it's possible. Or, um, or, or, or a significant increase in the median overall survival, which means the time you actually live from the time that you start the drug, and rarely discussed uh, improvement or at least maintenance of, of a good quality of life. Those are patients, what are called patient-centric benefits. They're, they're centered around what, what good the patient is going to get out of the treatment. But Many times, probably the, the, the great majority of times, when they talk about uh, benefit, when they talk about survival, they're not talking about living longer. They're talking about this meaning, basically meaningless construct. Then they, the drug under the impetus of the drug companies, they try to tell us that, oh, uh, progression-free survival is a surrogate or a stand-in for overall survival. Many, many people, you know, will say this, they have no proof of it. In most kinds of cancer, there is really no solid foundation for saying that increasing progression-free survival will make you live a day longer, but the drug companies love it because they can shorten the testing period from five years for overall survival down to two years a complete testing. And that gives them three more years and since the uh, to market the drug, and since every month is precious to them, it's a big scam because they basically get this accelerated approval from the Food and Drug Administration and similar agencies around the world. They can start selling their drug. It's oftentimes uh, they're making $100 million a month, every month that they can shave off the approval process. Some of these drugs now earn over $8, eight billion billion with a B, dollars per year. Um, and so it's just a way of accommodating the drug industry. And this was mostly forced on the FDA against their the wishes of the people at FDA by the Congress, which is heavily infiltrated, as everybody knows, by uh, big pharma lobbying. 
uh, to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. So it's a big, a big uh, scheme uh, that basically comes down to almost destroying the FDA's original gold standard, which is proving increased overall survival through randomized controlled trials. That's the that was supposed to be the standard by which drugs were going to be judged and approved. That's mostly gone now. And even when you do get increased overall survival, the actual benefit, and this has been proven many times, is between three and four months of increased survival for people with stage four uh, advanced uh, cancer. So even when you do get increased survival, with rare exceptions, and we should and, and, and can talk about those the exceptions, but for the co- most common kinds of cancer in the stage four, the conventional drugs either don't increase the patient's uh, o- overall survival or else offer a minimal amount of, of uh, increased living sp- lifespan. So let's zoom out even a little bit further before we go further down those criticisms. Let's take a step back and just ask the most fundamental question. Why are so many more people getting cancer today? When you look at the landscape and the growth of cancer historically, especially here in the United States, what are your thoughts on why are so many more people getting cancer and being diagnosed with cancer today and why it continues to grow? Well, I'll I'll take it even a step back further from that. What do we really know about the origin of cancer? We know that certain elements in the in the environment tied to pollution and to life lifestyle are powerful stimulators of development of cancer. The the foundation of our knowledge about the cause of cancer is the tobacco situation. We know that hundreds of thousands of people really over the course of of the last century hundreds of millions of people around the world have died as a result of tobacco uh, ingestion i mean smoking and uh, you know chewing and so forth so this is this has been known for a very long time i discovered an article uh, of tobacco as a cause of mouth cancer 100 cases in published in a, in a leading journal by a by a leading surgeon in 1915 so this is nothing new this has been known basically for anybody who is a good reader of the medical literature for a hundred years it was in the cancer textbooks uh, starting at least in 1928 that tobacco was a cause of lung cancer and uh, many other cancers they in fact they called these tobacco cancers so we we know this and so a logical approach to the cancer problem would have begun with uh, and mostly encompassed a, 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 uh, an examination of the environment and specifically uh, things that were unnatural in the environment, harmful, uh, and were had had some association with cancer. We know that this is the case with the, the predominant or the, the, the major cause of some kinds of cancer, which is tobacco, and secondarily, combining tobacco with alcohol, a particularly potent mixture of carcinogens. Now, this was this was known, this was being exposed, it was in the news, there was a whole fight around the tobacco cancer thing at Sloan Kettering in the 1950s and 1960s, and the fight against the industrial or the um, the environmental carcinogens was undermined first and foremost by the big tobacco, the, the tobacco industry, and and so when it came time to form the war on cancer, what did they do? The people who formed the war on cancer were themselves attached to, tied to in various ways, the tobacco industry, and the first leader of the war on cancer, 1971, 1972, a man named Benno Schmidt senior, his only job in life was to be the the assistant and the chief investor for Jock Whitney, who owned $50 million, inherited $50 million in 1928 in tobacco stocks. So whether that's coincidental or not, the war on cancer pivoted away from the good start that we made in terms of understanding carcinogens, environmental carcinogens, towards the search for a cure. But there were no cures 
And so they, they basically fiddled around for the next 15 years trying to invent a cure for the disease, and they had n- nothing. Meanwhile, it wasn't until 1982 that the National Cancer Institute even mentioned tobacco again. And then there was just a small pilot educational program. So they basically derailed the war on cancer, which started out as really a war on tobacco. Uh, they derailed that with the search for a cure, which instead of losing money for the Jock Whitney's of the world, would make fortunes for them. And that's been the basic distortion of the so-called war on cancer. And what we know, there is a certain element of cancer. It's a very relatively small percentage of cancers, like 7% or so, that are genetically uh, programmed and somehow in, in that, into the person. But overwhelmingly, which, which, uh, which, which sorry to, to no, just interrupt for, yeah, here. Yeah. I, I, I think that's a super important point because most people still today, when you survey the landscape, still think of cancer as primarily being a genetic thing separate from smoking as, oh, my parents had cancer. Oh, my grandfather had cancer. Right. I mean, it still seems that that's very pervasive out there in the world. I'll say, I'll say, and that, that line is pushed by people who don't want to change uh, lifestyle or change the structure of industry and uh, and horror of all horrors, maybe do away with an industry that's killing tens of millions of people, namely uh, tobacco. So, and that's not the only one. I mean, we've seen this, this play out with asbestos and with other things as well. So we have a few cancers, like, like uh, certain kinds of uh, colon cancer are caused by a, preceded by a condition called uh, familial polyposis that where people are prone to get, you know, these growths. And so I'm not, I'm not saying that, um, that genetics doesn't play any role at all, but it's been vastly overestimated and the public has been sold on the idea that cancer fundamentally is a genetic disease, which I take on a bit in, in my book, uh, Cancer Incorporated. But we know from, vast experience with the, in the medical and scientific literature that uh, lifestyle choices and industrial pollution are a far bigger element in terms of the cause of cancer, yet it, it's gotten nowhere, essentially. And for a long time, it was one individual, Sam Epstein, who sadly passed away a couple of years ago, he was a professor at the University of Illinois. He sort of carried this whole movement on his back. I mean, it was an incredible uh, achievement of Professor Epstein, but um, after he passed away, basically, you know, it almost disappeared. You don't see articles, I don't, in the paper about the industrial causes of cancer. Uh, you may be in alternate media, you do, but not in the mainstream media. So it became like all about the cures, and the cures um, essentially what it came down to with a lot of false starts became this very high tech uh, genetic manipulation where presumably the, the, the task at hand was to sequence the genome of the cancer and that's to say the genetic code of the cancer and of the normal patient and then isolate the mutations within cancer, target those mutations with drugs and voila, you know, your cancer is going to be in remission. By and large, uh, and this is government policy, by the way, this was the, the cancer moonshot and the precision medicine initiative of uh, a president, a president Obama. But by and large, this has been a bust. And I give the details in, in my book uh, for what has actually been achieved or rather not achieved as the NCI national cancer Institute has gone looking for uh ways to just use the genetic information of a tumor uh, as the basis for a treatment. Uh, This hasn't worked, uh, and I don't think it's going to work. Plus, the numbers financially are just incomprehensible because you have 1.76 million new cases of cancer every year in the United States, and to test a person's genome for the so for the most common cancer mutations costs about five or six thousand dollars as it as things currently stand. So now you do the math and you'll see that I I did it the other day, but I think it's like a hundred 
a hundred billion dollars to test everybody in the United States for um, for their genome to sequence their genome, and then you would need drugs to approach every one of these mutations. Well, how many mutations are there in cancer? You you can't get a straight answer, but I think three hundred and sixty would be a very conservative estimate, and maybe we have what. 20, 30 drugs already existing that target mutations, specific mutations. So as you discover these mutations, you're going to have to come up with drugs for each one of these. But the cost of developing a new drug on average, depending on who you talk to, it's between about $650 million to about $1.2 billion per drug. So now you're going to have to develop hundreds of new drugs just in order to target these mutations. And as James Watson pointed out 10 years ago, uh, cancer is very wily. So if you suppress these mutations, the, the cancer itself mutates then to a new form in order to get around your blocking of its growth pathway through these drugs. So it's an almost insoluble problem, and we can see the results of it. There's the NCI, NCI match uh, big clinical trial and a number of other uh, big clinical trials that are underway, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. I mean, in some and cases, why, there's no results. And in most cases, the mediocre results. And why you're putting so much emphasis on that is that, again, back to Cancer Incorporated and the industry and the business of cancer, we're really hanging a lot of the future hopes and dreams when it comes to making a dent in how many people have cancer or how many people get better from cancer and a cure for cancer on this approach. And if this approach is not working, it really, or doesn't look promising because of that, it's important for the listeners here who almost every single person listening has somebody based on the stats, has somebody touched by cancer. It's important for them to be informed and know about the landscape because just because the media or a company might be excited about it, if we don't understand its limitations and capabilities, it's hard to make an informed decision on what treatments you want to do for yourself or the or your loved ones. Correct. It's and two thirds of us are affected by cancer. You've had it in your family. I've had cancer not only in my family but personally. I have I've been treated for a rather aggressive um, prostate cancers, tumors. Um, so yes, it's very personal, and I know this is difficult to to hear. Uh, I must admit that when I when I got into writing this book, it, which started out as just a little report on the clinical trial situation, um, I was horrified by what I found. And as a as a person who's now trying to stay, you know, ho hoping to have defeated my cancer, but still, it's always on your mind. It was personally disturbing to me. And I thought to myself, do I really want to write this book? Because I remember when I was just in the midst of my very you know, active phase of making decisions about my own treatment, somebody approached me and I had already had in mind what kind of treatment I was going to take. And they started to badmouth that treatment. And I just couldn't hear it. I couldn't listen to that. I mean, it was just like a visceral reaction I had just I, I didn't want to ever talk to that person again because it was disturbing so disturbing now I think I made the right choice I hear I am almost five years down the road and it hasn't recurred so I think probably I made the right choice but I understand if people find this information disturbing but on the other hand as I said sometimes in life you have to take stock of what your actual situation is that's why I go in and I have PSA tests done twice a year. It's why I have MRIs done every year because you still want to know, even though your peace of mind is maybe tied up with the idea, well, they these doctors have it all in hand. They know what they're doing. They're brilliant people and so forth. Well, if, if that's what you need in order to have comfort and peace of mind, by all means, skip reading Cancer Incorporated. But if you need to know, if you if you're both your curiosity and your feeling that you have to make decisions based upon the most reliable information by somebody who has no no dog in the fight, you know, who has no vested interest one way or the other in in the treatment. Then I think it's it's a good book for for your listeners. I think so too. And you know, 
part of the approach of Cancer Incorporated is we need to understand the dysfunction, which is by and large, not a vast conspiracy theory, but a system that has become a de facto system. It was never designed to be this way, but it became this way because of corporate interest and the amount of dollars that are in the system, which also comes down to the level of who gets funded and what gets prioritized. But after you understand how dysfunctional the system is by reading the book, the next thing that you go into is helping people understand that it's not just about knowing how challenging and dysfunctional the system is. It's also about understanding evidence-based treatments, things that are out there that are showing strong promise. So I'd like to switch over in that direction. And you highlight three in the book that I'd like to just touch on briefly. And the first one that you talk about there is metabolic therapy. Can you give us a little bit of a background in what metabolic therapy is and why it might be something worth considering when it comes to someone approaching their cancer? Sure. So the basic idea behind metabolic therapy is that there is a difference between cancer cells as a, as a rule and normal cells in the way that they generate their energy and also dispose, uh, produce uh, so, uh, uh, waste material and dispose of it. Uh, and you can influence the cancer by interfering not with its genes, but with its energy supply. Because cancers, uh, like all cells, they need uh, energy in the form of packets of energy called ATP. And to generate that, the normal cell will basically respire, meaning that the normal cell will use oxygen. Uh, which is processed in the mitochondria of the cell, these little uh, little uh, power plants in the cell to produce very efficiently quite a bit of energy. Cancers are peculiar they've, in that they've lost a lot of these mitochondria or they become uh, dysfunctional. And so to, to uh, make up for the loss of the normal uh, respiration of the cell, they engage in a process of energy generation called fermentation. Uh, Dr. Otto Warburg in the 1920s uh, called this aerobic glycolysis. They directly break down glucose in order to produce uh, energy and the byproduct of that is lactic acid. So this is the peculiarity of cancer and it's the basis of a number of, of tests uh, for cancer, most prominently the PET scan, the positron emission tomography scan, which is normally based upon a um, uh, a, uh, a marker that uh, contains both glucose and a, tra a tracer element. And so where uh, cell cells are taking up a lot of glucose, so this form of glucose, is more or less taken as a sign of cancer. It could also be the sign of a healing reaction or certain organs in the body consume more glucose than others. But fundamentally, it, about 90% of cancers uh, overconsume glucose. And the degree to which they overconsume is can be considerable. I spoke to somebody yesterday who um, whose cancer was overconsuming glucose by about tenfold. Over their normal over normal tissue, that's how how much energy that these cancers need, both because they're deficient and also because um, they just have they're doing a lot of stuff, right? <laughs> Growing very fast and trying to metastasize into other organs and so forth. So you've got you've got a handle now, and this has been known since 1924. But you see that there's a handle on the cancer. And there are people who would go even further and say, well, this actually is the fundamental flaw within cancer. Uh, on a biochemical level or a cellular level, it's the, it's the failure, uh, the, 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 uh, the abnormality of the energy generating process that then leads to 
the genetic changes. And if this seems far-fetched to you, I very strongly suggest that you read Thomas Seyfried's book, Cancer as a Metabolic Disease. It's a medical textbook. It isn't inexpensive, but if you really want to get into this, look at look at Seyfried, S-E-Y-F-R-I-E-D. And uh, he also was my advisor on the writing of this chapter, by the way. So I, it was very, very beneficial to me. But this is a different approach. This is not the, geno- the usual genetic slash genomic approach. This is looking at a different part of the cell, the mitochondria. And I give some evidence for why... I think that the mitochondria is very critical in the whole cancer process. This is not my thinking. This is coming out of Sloan Kettering and other places where you see that a lot of drugs actually work on the level of the mitochondria. So we don't have to be tied so completely to a genetic model. Although all the scientific texts and starting with the National Cancer Institute um, website start out by saying cancer is a genetic disease. Well, that's that's a dogma. That's their belief. It's, uh, they're, they're stating as a fact something that actually needs to be proven, which I think is the definition of a circular argument, if I remember my, remember my college uh, logic. So um, basically, though, there's another way of looking at cancer, which is this metabolic approach. And there are books written about this. And it, what it has e- resulted in is a great interest in uh, in uh, keto ketogenic diets and uh, certain supplements and certain drugs, off-label drugs like metformin, most prominently the big uh, anti-diabetes, anti-type two diabetes drug, uh, oral drug metformin, which is the subject of thousands of journal articles relating to its its possible use in cancer. So there's another world out there, and I think the reader. But the listener who is not aware of this is going to be amazed at how far this has gone. It's almost like a world unto itself. But conventional oncologists don't pay much attention to this. I've never, I haven't met one actually who's even aware of it. And uh, in, in fact, they, they sometimes try to come in and completely dispel it. And we should remind listeners of the podcast that it can take anywhere between 12 and 17 years before things that are in the literature make their way out to being practiced, even though a lot of functional medicine doctors who are reviewing the landscape and researchers like yourself are reviewing it and and weighing out the pros and cons of doing something like this, especially when it comes to uh, this this um, this first topic of one of the intervent you know approaches that you had mentioned, metabolic therapy, there there, there are also to go back to what, how I started off, there's websites like if you search, you know, like Mayo Clinic and it says should people with cancer avoid or minimize sugar? And they list it as one of their top myths. Myths. Uh, yeah, it's a myth. People with cancer shouldn't eat sugar. Uh, it's a myth. Sugar doesn't make cancer grow any faster. Fact. It says fact. Sugar doesn't make cancer grow any faster. And obviously Mayo Clinic is one of the most respected places that are out there. And that answer is based on what the understanding was before of the information. Well, I guess I even share it this way. Why do you think, even though you make a strong argument, and even though there are a lot of practitioners, not just in the US and worldwide that are seeing beneficial approaches to reducing total sugar or carbohydrate load, processed carbohydrates in the body when it comes to treating and approaching cancer as one of the things, not saying that just cutting out sugar alone, it's often a complementary treatment along with everything else that somebody might do, chemotherapy or radiation. Why is it still that you have clinics like the Mayo Clinic saying, fact, sugar does not make cancer grow any faster? Right. And, um, you know, that's the old adage that everything is a myth until it's accepted. And then suddenly it's like it never happened. They never said any of those those things. They denied uh, every practically every truth that we have, and starting with the tobacco uh, issue, has been vehemently denied. The American Medical Association fought for decades against uh, against the idea that tobacco caused cancer, and in fact, uh, they were a major source. Uh, the uh, tobacco industry was paying off the editor of the journal, the American Medical Association. Uh, I would just say this. You know, the irony is that you go to a place like Mayo Clinic and if they want to detect your cancer, they're probably uh, going to give you a PET scan or a PET CT scan. The agent they're going to inject into you is called FDG. FDG is sugar. 
tied to a tracer molecule. They're going to look then an hour later, they're going to look and see which tissues take up the sugar and the areas that take up the sugar, meaning the FDG, are, are then highly suspect for being cancerous. Guys, just think about this. They're defining the cancer, defining it, defining its malignancy by the whether or not it takes up sugar and the extent to which you know the sugar the sugar gets into the, is take is sucked up by the cancer molecule. Your one department is using sugar FDG sugar to define find and define the cancer, and another department, the propaganda department, is putting out statements saying sugar has nothing to do with cancer. So I don't know how to deal yeah, with and in their this answer, dysfunctional. They do. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I don't know how to deal with that kind of dysfunctional thinking. Yeah. And, you know, for anybody that's following along, you know, because because the Mayo Clinic, you can just Google it. Does does uh, cancer and does sugar increase the growth of cancer cells? And it's not that simple. There's a lot more that's in there. But uh, Dr. Moss, you do a great job in your book, Cancer Incorporated. Uh, again, the link is in the show notes. Anybody can download it for free on the web or you can buy it. Uh, for pretty cheap. Um, you go through the history of it, the understanding why it was uh, tried to get discredited, that understanding, how it's making a comeback. Uh, all, all I know is this, is that in the field of functional medicine, when individuals and practitioners like Dr. Hyman and um, the practitioners at the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine uh, at our, or our medical center, the Ultra Wellness Center, when they work complementary with people who have cancer, it's a uh, regular part of the protocol uh, that that they are uh, reducing the total level of sugar that's inside of there. Even for my own mom, they reduce the total level of sugar that's yeah. being consumed, even from processed carbohydrates that are there, uh, based on an understanding of the literature and as part of the uh, additional therapies that are there. And if you want a further breakdown of the science, again, read the book, Cancer Incorporated, uh, um, that I mentioned earlier that you can find in the show notes. So let's, let's switch topics to a sec for, uh, to the second item, you know, to a protocol that you talk about, which is also a big part of your work, which is going out to different cancer, cancer centers throughout the globe and seeing what they're doing, because there are some interesting approaches in in Japan and especially in Europe. And one of the protocols that you talk about in the book that is one of the treatments that deserves more uh, more attention and there, there is some promise that's there. It's not a single treatment, but it's an approach. And it, I believe it's called the CLEAF protocol. Can you describe uh, this protocol and why is it that you wrote about it in the book, Cancer Incorporated? I can. And it also, I think at the same time, I need to um, describe the other uh, third treatment uh, that I that I describe in the in the book. Um, just give me one second. Which is immunotherapy and the history and the roots of immunotherapy, but essentially, I have believed since at least 1974, when I arrived at Sloan Kettering, most of my bosses, the top bosses, the top people at the center that I dealt with were immunologists and immunotherapists. Um, um, the president of the center and one of the two of, of the uh, president of the center, the president of the institute, Sloan Kettering Institute, and one of the two vice presidents, Lloyd J. Old, were all immunologists. So they were very progressive figures in the world of, of cancer, because immunology was seen as sort of the, the bad boy of cancer treatments at that time. Uh, ch a challenge to chemotherapy was seen as sort of the opposite of chemotherapy in, in a way. And so, um, and, and this was the context within, within which, uh, well, let me take a step back for a second. So the real force one of the real forces within that movement towards immunology, immunotherapy, was the vice president of Sloan Kettering, Lloyd Old. And Lloyd Old was in an intellectual partnership with a woman, a, a layperson named Helen Coley-Nortz, who was the daughter 
of William B. Coley, who invented cancer immunotherapy in the 1890s. So that's the background, that there was this ferment, and it was almost like an underground movement. It was very interesting of people who identified each other as being pro-immunology and therefore maybe a little bit critical of the main thrust, which was chemotherapy. And so this is the context in which I, fed, I met uh, I met Ralph Cleef, uh, who is now practicing in Vienna, Austria. Ralph was a, a young fellow of the Cancer Research Institute, which was an organization founded by, by Helen Coley Nortz to promote and save her father's work. And William B. Coley's uh, treatment, which was called Coley's Toxins or Coley's Fluid, was on, at that moment was on a blacklist of the American Cancer Society called Unproven Methods in Cancer Management, and it was prominently featured in this book as an invalid and, and uh, uh, quote unquote, quack treatment. Um, and so this was, this was a, you know, a, a, a movement, underground movement, if you will, uh, to try to save, promote, and resuscitate the Coley treatment, which had been very, very successful in the early days in treating a variety of cancers. And so um, this is where Ralph Cleef basically came from. He came out of the German um, medical school. He had done some advanced work at the University of Vienna. And then he came over as a fellow for two years at, um, at the Cancer uh, Research Institute slash Sloan Kettering Institute. And Helen Nortz had the good, good idea to introduce us. And so Ralph and I met and we've been friends and colleagues uh, ever since then. So at a certain point, and I kept track of him, he, he set up this clinic in Vienna, but at a certain point, the immune checkpoint inhibitor drugs, which were discovered by James Allison, um, about uh, the first one came out in, uh, in 2011, but these drugs were coming to the fore. Two more of them were approved in 2014, 2015. And so it occurred to a number of people whom I knew that these drugs, for various reasons, could be used at much lower doses than they were being uh, prescribed at, because we saw that there was a lot of toxicity associated with the conventional doses of these drugs. And one person in particular named Tibor Bakash, uh, who is a, um, a, a, uh, at the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, uh, he had the idea of using low doses of this, and he went over to Vienna from Budapest and talk to Cleef about this, and Cleef started this up about five years ago, and the results were dramatically positive. It turned out, I mean, with all our skepticism about pharmaceutical agents, it turned out that these particular pharmaceutical agents, namely the, the immune checkpoint inhibitors, really worked and worked well in a lot of cases. So it was a kind of revitalization in a way of of this group that I was uh, and continue to work with over in uh, Central Europe. Um, and Cleef continued then to refine the program because just to give these two immune checkpoint inhibitors, which are Yervoy uh, and Optivo, that might work in a case like a, a melanoma, but in the average cancer, for a whole variety of reasons, it, it, it doesn't work all that well. And Cleef was showing a way to use a lower dose of the drugs in order to dramatically lower the incidence of these serious side effects while stimulating the immune system with other methods that were similar to what William B. Coley had done. And the combination was, was really very, it was very heartening, the results with that. I can't talk to, in too much detail about it because the paper describing the first, I think it's 137 patients, but that paper is actually at the, um, you know, being submitted uh, right now to um, different journals. And so uh, it's a little premature w without having a, an actual publication to talk too much about it. But I would say that what it proves, what Cleef's experience proves is that these drugs, which are amazing advance in oncology, will work just about as well, if not better, in the low dose as they do in the high dose. And in my book, I go to great lengths to prove this through, I think, four separate publications uh, coming from 
top cancer centers like MD Anderson and, uh, and other places that basically show there really isn't much difference in responsiveness um, to these drugs if you use a, a very low dose or a very high dose. It's more like an on-off switch, like a toggle switch rather than a volume switch. So it's hard for oncologists to sort of wrap their heads around this, especially if they were trained in the era of classical chemotherapy, where you try to give maximum tolerated dose of a drug, practically kill the person, and then bring them back from the brink of death. This is, this is classical chemo thinking, but immunology is not like that. The immune system may just need a nudge in the direction of, uh, of reorienting itself to take on the, uh, the cancer. Um, and so while I pay great homage to James P. Allison, who is the head of immunology at, um, at MD Anderson, also, by the way, now heads up the same organization that Lloyd Old and Helen Coley Notes uh, founded. Um, I think there, that improvements can be made and the improvements are towards a more holistic approach that combines the immune checkpoint inhibitors in relatively low doses with a more personalized, individualized approach to the patient, such as many German clinics and Central European clinics uh, use. And so I think this has been a, a breakthrough moment, and there are some publications on this, uh, but the big paper is in the works right now, and I think it's very encouraging. Often when someone or their family or a loved one is diagnosed with cancer, it's just such a scary situation, and there's all sorts of different feelings that come up. And as people are trying to make the best decisions and find the right uh, doctors and providers, part of that is knowing what options exist. And I know you write in detail for the main types of cancers that are out there in the Moss Reports uh, website. Uh, and I've previously purchased the one on breast cancer for my uh, mom when we were looking at different interventions that were there. But sometimes people feel very confused uh, based on the advice of their uh, doctor that they're chosen or given by the insurance uh, companies that they're working with, their oncologist. And they're not always aware of different places and locations that are trying the best practices or are bringing interventions that even if there may not be uh, top level, double blind placebo controlled trials, there's a lot of promise that shows. And hopefully one day those treatments do get research. But how do you share with people? You know, people come to you and say, Dr. Moss, you know, I was just diagnosed with uh, cancer and I'm trying to find the best places to go. How do you give them a roadmap of what's available out there in terms of the locations and places and the team that they can find to work with them when it comes to addressing uh, the root causes and their cancer head on? Well, it depends on the individual. There is no one single right formula. Um, first of all, yes, it matters which kind of cancer the person has, but as we've discussed, there also are commonalities to most cancers in terms of the metabolism, you know, the, the body's metabolism. Um, I would say also where they're located, how old they are, what they're, uh, I don't probe into people's finances, but you know what I mean. If they have the resources to go abroad, um, those, all of those things come into play. So it would be counterproductive for me to say, or everybody should go to Ralph Cleef, for instance. Well, you know, Cleef has really done amazing things. But I can tell you from experience, it is not the right thing for everybody. Just going abroad, even if you can afford it, may not be the right thing. You have to assess like what that where that person is. And I, I got a I got a very uh, a great object lesson in this twenty five years ago when I first started doing consultations, and I was. Uh, I did a consultation for somebody who was an, a neighbor, uh, actually next door neighbor where I was living in, in Brooklyn at the time. And she wanted to go abroad for treatment. And finally, she went to Germany to a particular clinic that doesn't exist anymore. And she wound up hemorrhaging and had to be put into a, a standard German hospital, which was pretty awful for her and just barely was able to get back to the United States alive. And the family 
was actually quite angry, some of them, with, with me. I mean, because I, t I had told her about the existence of this clinic. I didn't tell her to go there, but she chose on her own to do that. But I realized at that point, well, this isn't for everybody. You know, uh, maybe a person might be too sick to be able to go. They might be, it might be too dangerous for them to fly. You know, there's many considerations. And so I would say that it, when I do consultations for cancer patients, I'm drawing on 45 years of experience of having traveled to what, 20, 25 countries and made 18 separate trips to, to Germany alone. So I'm drawing on that knowledge in order to try to match people up to something that's doable and feasible. And then, of course, I just have to leave them to their own devices in terms of making contact with those clinics and trying to establish a, a good rapport with them. So I'm not saying that there's any one magic formula here. Um, it's basically uh, a matter of individualizing, which oncology is supposed to do. You know, they're supposed to be do, for practicing personalized medicine, and I rarely see that happening. When it came to your own cancer story, and you had mentioned about your own diagnosis, and uh, which is a form of aggressive uh, prostate cancer in 2015, how did you put your team together and what challenges did you go through in that process? Yeah. So I found, I discovered that I had prostate cancer through a very unconventional test called Oncoblot that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, my wife and I both took that test and she came up clean, thankfully. And I came up unequivocally with prostate cancer, with having prostate cancer. And sure enough, you know, when I went to my uh, urologist, I was living in central Pennsylvania at the time, she assured me with no, with complete assurance that I didn't have uh, prostate cancer. Uh, I, she couldn't feel anything. The PSA was, uh, was elevated, but it had been elevated for many years. So she said, and even if you do have prostate cancer, it's, you'll die of something else. You'll die with it, I think is how she put it, not, not of it, uh, which is kind of a dogmatic statement that uh, people sometimes get. Well, I wasn't satisfied with that. I wanted to, because I believed in this Oncoblot test, they'll do, um, but it doesn't exist anymore, unfortunately. But uh, I decided, well, I'd go and get an MRI. And she wrote a prescription for an MRI for me, um, but I wanted to get the 3T MRI, the, the most advanced at the time, the most advanced MRI. And I wound up at a, let's just say, a top rated urological urology department at an Ivy League affiliated um, hospital. I, I don't need to mention which one that was. And it was a near catastrophe because the doctor who who examined the case, took, you know, the case examined the computer screen, I should say, didn't look at me, never shook my hand, mumbled his name by way of introduction. And, uh, and I don't believe to this day that this doctor was actually looking at my record. I think he, it was, the, it was the late Friday afternoon. I think he had had it for the week and I was, he made a mistake and he basically told me that I was, that the cancer had spread, it was all over my body, and there was nothing basically curative that they could do for me. So I was in despair. My wife, my wife and I were, you know, like sitting on the edge of the bed in the in the motel room, like looking at each other, like where do we go from here? And uh, I call. I had a friend. I didn't know him that well at the time, but I knew him, uh, named Gio Espinoza, who was a naturopathic doctor on the staff of NYU, New York University, Langone. And I, I had his cell phone number and I called him and told him the story. And he was very kind and one, a wonderful, wonderful person. And he, he was very kind to me and said, look, just don't, you know, I'm not telling you you have to come to NYU, but just don't make any decisions. They wanted me to come in for a biopsy at this other place. He said, don't make any decisions at all. I would really suggest that you talk to my colleague, Samir Taneja at NYU. And, and so that's what I did. Um, and I'm glad I'm here today, I think, because, because of that. And I, I went to see, I made an appointment, took a few weeks to, to get in. 
Um, and I went to see him, even though it was very inconvenient. I was 200 miles from New York, but I really felt it was that important to find somebody both capable and also humane. And it went fine. I mean, it wasn't a love fest. It's just a very professional relationship. But uh, what he offered me was music to my ears because he said, first of all, uh, I'll walk you through the MRI so you can see where this cancer is and where it isn't. And he showed me to my, my and my wife's great reassurance that it had not escaped the capsule. It was not all over my body. It was two lar localized, largish um, tumors in the prostate. And he did the biopsy and it came up as a Gleason 8, which is considered to be a very poor prognosis. And there were two of them. So the good news, the bad news was, yes, I had cancer to large tumors that were aggressive. The good news was that he felt he could treat me with cryoablation. And as I say, that was music to my ears because it didn't involve surgery and it didn't involve radiation, which is a carcinogen. So I, uh, I, I had that procedure done. And there's a benefit to cryoablation, which is freezing the tumor out, basically killing the tumor with cold. And that benefit, there is a potential benefit of uh, basically vaccinating the person from inside. In other words, you, as you kill that cancer with freezing and thawing, you're releasing a small amount of the markers of that cancer into the bloodstream, which then creates an immune reaction, just as if you had created a vaccine and given it to the person. So there's a, there's a side benefit to the cryo, but the main thing is it destroyed those tumors. And every year I have an MRI and everything is the same as he left it after he did the procedure. And every, you know, side effect wise, it's been very, you know, perfectly fine. And so uh, I kind of dodged not just a bullet, but a couple of bullets. The beautiful thing that I love about that story is besides the fact that you're okay and you're still here <laughs> and you're still around with us to continue this important work mm -hmm. and mission that you're up to is that even yourself, somebody who I consider like a cancer historian and a deep researcher in the field of knowing what works and doesn't work in the landscape or what at least is up and coming and what's controversial that people should know about. Even you went through a situation where it was important to question the people that are around you, well-meaning, right? Well-meaning yes. doctors are working hard. They're trying their best to do stuff. They're human beings. They do make mistakes. That's why I think that medical deaths besides doctors, you know, nurses, just the hospital system are like the third medical mistakes, I think are the third or the fourth largest reason of why we uh, mm -hmm. have deaths here in the United States, at least yeah. and even yourself, you had to push back and get a second opinion. And I think that's the importance of having a cancer team and, uh, or with any chronic d disease to really question the approaches to get a few different a few different opinions on it so that you can make the best next move with the most amount of information inside the practitioners that are out there that are trying to work with you or your family or your loved ones they're doing their best and they're coming to you with what level of research or knowledge that they have they're just human beings like we are so asking around will make you more um Asking around and building the right team will get you more solidified in what approach that you decide to take with any chronic disease, but especially when it comes to cancer. Totally agree. So let's conclude on a couple points. There are people that are listening to this podcast that knock on wood do not currently have cancer, but are worried about it. Maybe somebody in their family has had it. And even though they know that it's not purely genetic, they're wondering about their own ability uh, to develop the to develop cancer in the future because they've seen the stats. What are your recommendations for individuals who are listening, who even if they haven't been touched by cancer directly or don't have cancer, they're thinking about how to minimize their risk in the future? What have you seen that's out there of things that we can control and pay attention to that could possibly support the process of minimizing our risk? Well, of course, the, the obvious one is not to smoke. And if you if you are smoking, to stop and in whatever way possible to, to do that. Um, drinking and smoking is almost a prescription for developing certain drinking alcohol, uh, certain kinds of cancer. Um, and I think also there's something going on with the standard American diet, um, the 
the amount of carbohydrates of junk, uh, so-called garbage, uh, in the in the diet. I'm not saying that you have to adopt an extreme ketogenic diet, which is essentially, from the point of view of uh, overall health and so forth, is not really proven, and certainly not proven in the case of cancer. But I do believe that if you look at our diet compared to a traditional diet, uh, it's out of whack. And a lot of that has to do with added sugar, but it also has to do with um, carb, uh, refined carbs in particular. So it's important to, to get the, the blood sugar question settled because the current um, estimates are between half and two thirds of the American adult population is diabetic or pre-diabetic, meaning probably on the road to diabetes, type 2 diabetes. And these are horrendous numbers. And I also saw an estimate the other day that something like 50% of the adult population was going to be obese within about 10 or 15 years from now, given current trends. What does this have to do with cancer? I mean, first of all, uh, there is a heightened incidence of cancer um, among people with diet type 2 diabetes. And secondly, if you go back to our discussion about sugar and cancer, uh, the, the cancers thrive on sugar. About 60% typically of a tumor's energy comes from fermentation, which is an excessive, which relies on an excessive amount of glucose in the blood. Ultimately, that's sort of the, the glu blood glucose is the common denominator of many foods that you eat. So I would say not to allow the blood sugar to get into a, a high category, even if you still have ability to metabolize it. But if it's spiking upward, that means there's some, either you're eating wrong and or you have impaired metabolism, which is now becoming the rule rather than the exception. So I think uh, tackling that is a major part of trying to cut back on numerous diseases. It's sort of the common denominator. They, they used to call that uh, uh, syndrome X or metabolic syndrome. And it's so common, especially in people like myself who are basically sedentary, you know, writing books. Uh, it's hard, Well, I mean, I guess you could get a treadmill and write while you're treading or something, but I don't do that. I just, you know, sit around and write my book. And sometimes in the middle of the night, I'm up editing and so forth. So, uh, you know, the same issues for everybody, but it's a good idea to who, whatever your condition, whatever your age is to, to get a lot of activity, get it, get in as many steps as you can, uh, during the day and try to eat on the low carb end of things. You don't have to go straight out keto, but you can, you can minimize your uh, your basically your carb intake, and I would say, if you're really concerned about this, get a glucose monitor. It's only about twenty twenty five bucks. Um, I like the the Freestyle Light one uh, from Abbott, and the strips are I don't know maybe a dollar a piece. And but if you take your morning glucose test for a few days in a row, you'll see pretty well you know, how well you're doing, and you may already be in the, you may already be in the, um, in the pre-diabetic range, which is like between 100 and 126 is considered pre-diabetes, depending on how high you are. And this is a clear indication. If you have a repeat score, fasting glucose in the, in the morning, if you have a repeat score in, you know, in the one hundreds or the one tens, you're already having some impairment probably in terms of your ability to metabolize uh, food, especially carbohydrates, this relates to cancer in numerous ways. But you can die from other things, and it's also an indicator of, of, of high risk for other causes of death as well. So this is very important, and you don't have to be a diabetic in order to uh, get a glucose meter and take that test. It's available to anyone, and as I say, the cost is is very reasonable for doing this, this sort of miracle machine that, that so many people now rely on. And then you'll know where you stand. And that's remediable. If you have, if you have pre-diabetic uh, between losing weight, dieting, and stepping up your activity level, 
should bring that under 100 and put you back into the normal range. Now, 83 is some people consider that to be the optimum uh, score in terms of a morning uh, glucose. But even if you're around that, you're, you're, you're fine. You've got good metabolism. But don't ruin it by having a lot of sweets because you can spike your glucose upward for a certain period during the day. And then if you've got a fairly strong metabolism, it'll come down again the next morning. So you won't pick up on the fact that you actually had some dangerous moments there. And with all due respect for the Mayo Clinic, I think they're way off base about this question about the relationship of sugar and cancer. And there's a wealth of information to, to prove that. You know, one of the tests that you mentioned earlier that you used actually for early detection, which no longer exists, is called Oncoblot. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm not fully aware of all the reasons why that test is no longer available. But part of the cancer treatment approach is also how do we discover and find it earlier? Are you aware of anything that's out there that's on the horizon or coming up on the horizon that might help us uh, detect cancer earlier for our listeners who are interested in that? Well, there are tests and we're getting better and better at that. Um, so-called so liquid biopsies and so forth. I, I would look at the, some websites um, of companies offering that sort of testing. Foundation Medicine, which is owned by Roche, one of the top ten, top nine or 10 drug companies in the world, uh, they offer a variety of tests. People could look at that. I think, you know, you can get heads up. You can look for circulating tumor cells, for instance, and see if there was, if there's a abnormal number of circulating tumor cells, then there is a strong suspicion that there's cancer, and you could work with your doctor to try to isolate where that might be. Isn't always easy. Um, and in general, I prefer MRIs over CAT scans. And I, I prefer uh, ultrasound over over X rays for the simple reason that they don't involve radiation and radiation, although it's absolutely necessary in a lot of situations, but it's also overprescribed. So I would say, um, you know, that one could, one could look for these things, but the most important thing is to modify your lifestyle, your smoking or non-smoking, your, your drinking habits and your food intake. And, um, and also by the way, keeping a, p a positive, outlook on life, it's underest you know, underestimated in terms of the importance of that, because the, the mind and the mood were, uh, has an effect on the, on the immune system, and the immune system is absolutely important in terms of uh, resistance against cancer, even though this, this theory of immune surveillance has taken a lot of hits over the the, the uh, half a century since it was um, first propounded, the idea that the immune system exists in order to uh, fight, resist, and kill cancer cells. But there is an element of truth to that. I would say this also, that when you have, next time you go for a checkup, make sure that they do a complete blood test. And there's one number in particular that's particularly uh, telling, and that is the absolute lymphocyte number. This is very important, both for cancer patients and for people just who want to maintain good health, because there were studies done at uh, University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center showing that people who had an absolute lymphocyte number of 1,800, or sometimes written as 1.8K, uh, had much better survival uh, when receiving immune therapy than people who didn't. So I take that as a hint that there is sort of a, a baseline number that you want to be at just so happens com completely coincidentally. That's exactly what my score was the last time that I looked. I didn't, I didn't do anything in particular to make that happen. It's just coincidentally that it turned out to be that. But if mine was dipped lower than that, um, I probably would more aggressively take mushroom supplements like Orient, like Asian mushrooms, like maitake, shiitake, and uh, oyster mushrooms. Um, like as a broth or even as a supplement, uh, because mushrooms are medicinal. Uh, the Asian mushrooms are medicinal and they particularly have an effect on the immune system. So I want to make sure that my immune system is, uh, is kept, you know, in good shape as I do like any abnormality. And I think if you've got a good naturopath or, uh, 
a uh, functional medicine doctor or just a, a an aware um, sympathetic uh, physician uh, or other practitioners that they can look at your blood scores um, and be able to say, well, you're a little low on this, or I'm a little concerned about the elevation of this liver enzyme or whatever it is, and then use non-toxic things like supplements and botanicals to try and primarily to try to adjust those numbers. And I think this is true for cancer patients as well. I mean, I'm not saying you should just take fistfuls of supplements or antioxidants, just willy nilly, you know, throw everything at it. Uh, that's not an intelligent approach. But I think uh, a doctor uh, or a na- either a medical doctor or a naturopathic, a licensed naturopathic doctor, they can look at those things and be able to tweak your scores so that you remain uh, healthy while you're undergoing treatment. I want to conclude on this, and those are all great recommendations. Thank you so much for that. For anybody who's listening right now who recently received a diagnosis of cancer or has a family member who did and is going through this whirlwind of feeling lost, maybe sometimes not hopeful about the future. What's the lasting message that you want to leave for them in this conversation? Well, I think it's, it's very important that you uh, assemble a, a team or you have somebody, an anchor for you. It's a well-known fact that uh, single men do much, much less well in terms of uh, outcome of treatment than either women as a whole or married men. They're just looking at men in this instance. But, and I think women are, you know, they're friendlier, they're more, they have more, I'm just, uh, I'm just looking around me, you know, thinking about my own, my own uh, circle of people, but it's harder for men sometimes to relate emotionally or to expose their feelings. But I think it's very important that you have a circle of, of people around you, both to help you to get to meetings, to take notes uh, while you're talking to the doctor and just for emotional support to reach out and whatever, in whatever way or form you can do so. So that would be the the first thing I would say. The other thing is uh, don't, don't uh, accept the first diagnosis that's given to you. Uh, the, there was a study done, it was a, a while ago, so I don't know if it's still uh, applicable, but it's a famous study in which they uh, showed, in a blinded fashion, they showed pathologists different slides of, of uh, cancer, cancer patients, cancer uh, tissue, and they asked them to make a diagnosis based on this, and actually the error rate or the different, the, let's say the disagreement rate was 25% among the pathologists. And astonishingly, where they would slip in some slides that they had previously shown the same doctor. And 19% of the time, the doctor would disagree with, with himself or herself in terms of what the diagnosis was. So just don't take the word of one person uh, or even one particular team, you don't know. There's so many errors are made and you could wind up being treated for something you don't have. It may not be cancer. You have to get a professional, uh, uh, multiple opinions about it. Second, even third opinions, sometimes if necessary, or, you know, it could be, they could identify the wrong kind of cancer, especially if it's something a little bit uncommon, unfamiliar, uh, then you really need to consult if you can with, uh, you know, or have the doctor send it off for another, another opinion at another a top center, like a, a Memorial Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or Dana Farber. Um, this would be impo- another important thing. And um, don't panic. Don't make decisions out of panic as, as, op- as almost happened to me, because I understand how that can come down, but that could lead to a cascade of really bad effects. And I, I feel this in my own case, even though there was nothing, no particular action that they were going to take at that first hospital, uh, I do feel that I, did, I really s- saved my life, really, to get out of a bad situation. If something feels wrong to you, it probably is. And if you're being mistreated on a personal human level, it's probably the wrong place for you. I don't buy this theory that 
you know, you can go to somebody who is like fantastic technical skill, but lousy personality. I just, I can't accept that. I mean, maybe, maybe that's sometimes the case, but I would just keep looking because um, there's somebody out there who's going to be able to both treat you humanely and decently and also, you know, have the technical skill to be able to treat you. There's a big, it's a big world out there. It may not even be in your own country, maybe another country or maybe down the block, but just demand that you be treated right and expect that you have a right to just basic human decency in the treatment. And because I think people who don't care about other people to the degree that they would be thoughtless uh, towards somebody who's obviously suffering and going through the mo- what may be the biggest crisis of their life, I can't trust that person in terms of the efficacy of their of their treatment. So I think you have to keep looking. And I also think that every patient, and I'm repeating myself a little bit here, but I, I'm going to emphasize this, that every patient who's under good, solid medical care still needs that, that we'll call it for the sake, for the lack of a better word, naturopathic element to their treatment, the holistic element. And that means to try to find uh, a naturopath, uh, or it could be an herbalist. It could be best, you know, would be even a medical doctor who is very knowledgeable about the other aspects of treatment. It could be a psychotherapist. It could be a lot of different things, but it's important that you you have a you you pursue a holistic approach, not out of some sentimental attachment to just to natural things, but because cancer is a multifocal process. It isn't, it doesn't attack just on one level. It's a multi-level disease. And so you have to come at it from every, every angle, basically, including there's this very powerful mental slash emotional spiritual aspect to this that really reaches into the, you know, the deepest levels of our consciousness and our unconscious subconsciousness So it has to be approached holistically. And then when you do that, then you're going to have self-confidence in terms of getting the best possible outcome. And that's a self-fulfilling prophecy because you will have the best possible outcome. Incredible advice and such important advice for everybody who's listening here. Dr. Ralph Moss, thank you so much for sharing that. Let's talk about some of the offerings that are there. I've mentioned it twice now, three mm-hmm. times maybe, but I think it's so important and it's a great free resource. Cancer Incorporated, which is the new book, it's out there. How do people get it? They just go to our website, mossreports, one word, dot com, and uh, they can just uh, enter their email and then they'll be able to a click, make a, a click and download the book. The book will appear in their uh, in their email box, and it's a very very simple process for doing that. Awesome, and you can find that link in the show notes. And you also have the reports that I mentioned earlier, and then you mentioned about consultations that you do. Could you just talk about those briefly? I just wanted to also add that if they if they want to just go straight to the book. It's mossreports.com slash cancer incorporated. So that, that would bring them straight up to right straight to the book. Yes, we also, I mean, my main, my main work um, is to write Moss reports, which are um, very um, thorough summaries of what I feel the, a cancer patient with a particular diagnosis needs to know. This is if I if I had their disease, this is what I this is the book that I would want to have in order to really understand the field. And they've grown over the period of 20, more than 25 years. Uh, They've grown. Each book is about 500 pages in length. Uh, They can download this. Um, There is a fee for that, but they can download that at our website or they can get it. They can get it uh, in a physical form as a as a book sent to them. Uh, we, we have that as an option. And, um, and so each of those goes through all the aspects that I think is, are, are really crucially important of each particular disease. And I think there's 
I've lost track, but I think it's um, about 30, the 38 different um, loss reports now on the main. This covers about 95% of all the cancer diagnoses. So uh, there are those loss reports that are available and I upload those, excuse me, I update those periodically. And then um, uh, I also do consultations, phone consultations for people with cancer, which are generally about an hour in length. And that way we get a chance to um, individualize and particularize their situation so that I'm thinking now in terms of my 45 years of experience in this field, what are the treatments that are most important? And we'll usually cover the different types of cancer treatment uh, that are being offered to them or perhaps not offered. And that would include chemotherapy, hormonal therapy, where, where that's uh, significant or that's um, meaningful. Um, there's targeted therapies and there's immunotherapy and metabolic therapy. So those are the, the main areas that need to be looked at because very often people are getting the right prescription in terms of chemotherapy, but nobody's discussing immunotherapy with them. So this is, uh, this is a meaning that uh, it's a failure on the part, sometimes on the part of the oncologist who basically plugs the patient in to, uh, you know, puts them on the conveyor belt and basically they then get that treatment that's prescribed by the guidelines, the, na the national guidelines, but doesn't, doesn't take into effect what's emerging in oncology. So we try to go to integrate a depth about that and talk about things that we've talked about on this, on this program in terms of the diet and so forth. Powerful. And we'll link all those in the show notes and more. Dr. Ralph Moss, thank you again for your incredible work and for highlighting the dysfunction that's out there so that not that we can be overwhelmed or lose hope, but that we can get interested in the subject, navigate through our healthcare and see other hopeful treatments and possibilities that are out there to improve our lifestyle and end up beating cancer. I thank you and I appreciate you for coming on the Broken Brain Podcast. Thank you, Drew.